you don't like it. Okay. Ine Papic, friend, colleague, president of the Slovenian Society for Analytical Psychology. Thank you for accepting to join this conversation, which I title War as Reset. Let me frame our conversation. Many wish the pandemic was nothing more than a bad dream, a nightmare. The truth is that it is still a reality for the most of the world's population as we speak. Hong Kong is suffering another wave of Omicron. Many wish the Russo-Ukrainian war is nothing more than a bad dream, a nightmare. And according to psychoanalysis, nightmares can only disappear when the meaning is represented. This is why I wish to conduct this new series titled War as Reset. The aim of these conversations that are available on YouTube, for me, are very important, precious, and follow somehow, ideally, my work on breakfast at Kuznach and uh, the lockdown therapy book and series where, where you're also part of. If we follow Andrew Samuels, who suggested that within the microcosm of an individual and the macrocosm of the global village, we are floated by psychological the themes and that politics embodies the psyche of people. Andrew Samuels also said that, well, it is actively demonstrated how useful and effective perspective derived from psychotherapy might be in the formation of policy in new ways of thinking about the political process and in the resolution of conflicts. This is exactly why I want these conversations. Therefore, this series I wish will be an opportunity for depth and to contrast or even compensate the current, what I call media voyeurism, where we eat war on a daily basis, where war is an attraction, the attraction to eat war. We are attracted by war, and we should read Votan, that is from 1936. Although we wish war to be as far as possible, war is in our TVs as news and is only helpful to media outlets to sell more and more, more advertisement, but not necessarily to inform. We also saw this in the early phases of the COVID pandemic. So there is no depth there. I call this media bulimia, which reflects to paranoia, panic, selfishness. What do you think? Oh. I would say, first of all, interesting thoughts. Uh, I would say at least where am I and my perception of war uh, is certainly beyond uh, media voyeurism. Mm -hmm. We are just too close. We have friends there, some friends are here who escaped. Uh, it's the, the war is actually next door. So, so you feel it, you feel it in the psyche, in the collective, you, you can see refugees on the street meet. You are oh. 500 kilometers? Something like that. Between us and Ukraine, it's, it's hun Hungary. Uh, but I think it's, it's probably not much <laughs> that much difference between Berlin or, or this Central East Europe. Uh, what I noticed, however, when looking at main media, that you, similar to the COVID, you really have to dig deeper, deeper um, to get something which is not kind of a pop short news. Um, that you get some depth, that you get some content, that if you try to somehow understand what's really happening, what's not so, just some flashy news, what's really important and what, what not, uh, you really need to invest actually to find it. So all these big media, let's say, outlets, Let me give you an example. Hmm? Let me give you an example. This is the cover of the New Yorker. Yes. Tank. Snow, 
it's almost 80 pages. Only 20 are dedicated to war. Of course, the next issue will be 80 pages about war. Why? Because probably this magazine was already closed and ready to go to print and war erupted. But then I think of the BBC, the CNN, or I watch Italian medias, they keep spitting, vomiting the same information every half an hour without depth. Let's try to go in depth. Maybe we will fail, but I think it's, it could be a great opportunity. My first question is, and I know this is a sensitive question to you, because you are Slovenian. You were born under Yugoslavia. You, as a child, experienced war in your own country. What is war, Tina? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Maybe from the personal sense, I see many similarities to what's happening at the moment in, in Ukraine and what happened at that time in Slovenia. There are, of course, also some big differences. Uh, but one of the things was when, when, when the, the, let's say, the Berlin Wall collapsed and the Soviet Union collapsed, at that time Slovenians somehow joined. We are otherwise split nation between left and right very much. But, but at that moment, there was a certain movement. Uh, it's called the Spring Movement. It, the idea was to, to separate, to get our own country and what was interesting, if I connect it to, to the war, so idea of people was, we could travel. We were, Yugoslavia was somehow between the, it was the so-called uh, independent, you know, movement. And I don't know what's the right, it was now Vershani. It's like India was also there. Tito started this movement, countries that are neither in, on the West or the East Bloc. So we were in between, we could travel to, to of course, to let's say to Italy, or, or people went shopping to Trieste, people I'm from Maribor, we went to Graz and so on. And somehow it was frustrating for people to see the West flourishing. You know, our shops were, there was less things to buy. Um, we were poorer. Uh, everything was a bit more gray somehow. So we had this, you know, the West looked kind of a, like a heaven. You know, a bit, uh, of course, idealized. Then no, nothing is so perfect. But in the imagination of people, it looked like, well, we, we need this kind of life. Um, and somehow separation would bring us, not just separation, but also change of the system, that we would become part of the Western world, Western of the Europe, of capitalism at the end. Uh, uh, and to have democracy. This, this looked like the obvious path. I personally still think it was the right one, also, although there were many disillusions, you know, <laughs> by, uh, by, by the people. Um, but still, I think uh, when you under the, let's say, it's, it's still much better than it was. Uh, the thing that we expected from the West, you know, like if we will say we would like to join, we will be welcomed, we will be accepted to NATO, to European Union. What happened later, but at that, that moment, actually the Americans said no, it was the Warren Zimmerman, at that time ambassador in Belgrade, US ambassador, and he actually threatened, if you leave Yugoslavia, communistic Yugoslavia, we will never acknowledge you as a free country, as a country in general. So this support didn't come. Now, Europe was a bit different. Uh, Vatican supported us. Uh, Germany supported us. Um, Baltic states who were in similar position also acknowledged us Im immediately. Uh, so it was a bit different, but what didn't in our imaginations, it was like a war cannot happen, you know, because it's, it's uh, the 90s of the 20th century, it's the middle Europe, there can be no war here. And if, let's say, Yugoslavian army would try something, someone from the West would come and stop everything. This was like in general collective imagination, someone would, will come and save us. And it didn't happen. There, there were some people like US against it at the beginning, some, some states supporting us. 
not even giving us weapons. They, they said embargo, uh, which means we had to smuggle the weapons in because this embargo really didn't help if, if our movement was without arms. And on the other side, you have one of the biggest armies in Europe, you know, it, it was kind of a, and then Europe says, no, oh, let's close, you know, no weapons should come in the country and one side is full of uh, the arms. This was kind of unfair, but at, at the end we won. The war, here the difference to Ukraine is because conflict also started between Croatia and Yugoslavia, which was actually Serbia. So they couldn't invest in more fronts, you know. We were somehow, they weren't successful here and then another conflict started. So they couldn't, they just said, okay, let them go and let's concentrate on, on, on the war, war between what was actually at the end between Serbia, Croatia and in Bosnia, between all parties. So Slovenia somehow got away quickly, let's say out of this war because the others, suffered at the end, paid the price. And then, um, but th there are, I would say quite, quite a lot sim of similarities. Here I was surprised in, in the last war, in this Ukrainian war, that contrast to us, Europe actually is much more united. Also US and Europe is actually helping, uh, it's sending, um, it's sending weapons, it's sending um, food, it's sending money, which didn't happen at that. In our case, it was like you're alone and then find the weapons. On. In your case, as well as Syria, Afghanistan, Sudan, Rwanda, and we can go back, 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 was a civil war, mm -hmm. a war within one country. This is the first time that since the Second World War, two sovereign countries are at war, or one sovereign country, Russia, attacks another sovereign country. Let me take, let me share with you my take on this war. You said something interesting. In the 90s, there was this, we want to belong to West. We want maybe European American life standard, McDonald, Hollywood, uh, Levi's jeans. Okay, questionable. What is going on now? I strongly believe. And Ukraine told us this in the early 2000 and in 2014 in Maidan. It's not that they want the West lifestyle, McDonald's, BMW, or whatever. They want, and we will see what Abermas and Derrida have to say. They want to become a country that is institutionally healthy. What does it mean? It means that although the flows are politics, the ups and downs, the pushes, the tension, the changes into the, the, the chambers of the parliaments, the presidents, the government, the institution are healthy and stable. And if if there is an attempt of revolution from the outside and from the inside, the institution are stable. Example is the United States. I disagree with Tom Singer, who I interviewed a couple of days ago, who says that United States is at war. Well, yes, they are at war since the Second World War with everyone who doesn't ally with them. And I said this to him, but he meant in inside. No, there is there is a big tension in the US, there is not war and is not comparable to Ukraine. But the example of Trump to Biden shows this healthy institution that can, although trouble years, can set election and elect someone else that doesn't become an authoritarian uh, president or a dictator. For me, Ukraine is saying we want to go west, more to Europe than to the US. And we will see what Abermas and Derrida say, because they don't want to be conducted by someone else. And they want to be able to be an healthy country politically. Yes. 
this is where I see my similarities with Slovenia. Our dream was to have our own country with all these problems now, um, without corruption, because communistic system at, this, at the end, it was kind of uh, corrupted uh, in this sense that uh, there was a ruling class, Milorad Gilas wrote, he was beside Tito, one of the leading communists, but then he became very critical when he saw what, what became out of it in the war. And uh, he wrote a book, The New Class, because actually this ruling class of bureaucrats became like the new, the new establishment, the new feudal rulers, you know, who owned everything and the others didn't have anything. So it was kind of in a certain way corrupt system and it was wish for all this another problem was also um i don't know can you have your own company can now from psychological point of view can you individuate can you have this idea and open mcdonald's for instance uh, or you cannot because everything is public and you, you are not allowed to have your own company and so on and now it's it depends in, in Slovenia, it was half open, for instance. In Bosnia, it was more close. They couldn't have like even small, small, small companies like uh, people own business. Uh, but it's, it's about plurality of the psyche. Can I become whatever I do? Mm -hmm. what, uh, whatever emerges out of my psyche, we are looking psychologically. Or is there someone, some system which is repressing, you know, and putting structure? Uh, maybe one view could be like that this is the I, I wrote this in the paper we just presented in rome and uh, this conference of analysis and activism of communism it could be viewed as a sort of collective mother complex you know which is somehow it takes care of the citizen mm -hmm. so there was like no unemployment even if the jobs were shitty you know but somehow People felt safe. I don't need to worry about my job. I don't need to worry about anything. Of course, the system at the end didn't work because of many things. Uh, but people felt in a certain way safe. And now in capitalism, it's not like that. You have to fight all the time, you know? And this was like a mother complex. Okay, I take care of you. You will get a flat, you will get a job, no matter if you finish school or not. But on the other side, there is many rules what you can do and you cannot do. People really didn't individuate. Uh, and, and here, this was my idea, actually, the nation is individuating through these institutions and also people. Uh, you know, there, there is this word homo sovieticus, you know, like the... the, the Stay, stay here one second. Let me, let me... We will come to the homo sovieticus as uh, um, uh, Nobel laureate Alexievich underlines, because she also underlined in a book that war is masculine. Yes. So we could ask, but this time for the first time, we see that among the fighters, there are not only male, there are also women, women that bring their kids to, to school or around the city and they hold a gun. Mm -hmm. But let me come back on two points. The first is Jürgen, uh, Jürgen Abermas and Jacques Derrida look of Europe. And then I want to come back to what you mentioned about the father complex, sorry, the mother complex and talk about the father complex. Maurizio Ferrara, who is an Italian journalist on Corriere della Sera on the 7th of March, um, wrote, the war in Iraq gave an important shock to Europe. In the wake of the massive street demonstration, two great European intellectuals, Abermas and Derrida, asked themselves the question, what binds Europe together with respect to the international order? Their answer was a political mentality different from the American one and based on same common traits. An aversion to use to the use of force, first of all, and therefore an insistence on law and respect for international legality, support for a global system based on liberal multilateral institution and on human rights, 
fruit of the past inspired by opposite principle and characterized by centuries of bloody carnage, precisely this mentality had to push Europe to build a foreign and security policy anchor to the EU, overcoming the stupid and simplistic opposition between war and peace. Ferrara continues, it is for this reason that Europe has looked, no, sorry, uh, it is for this reason, I ask you, that Europe look the other way until now with respect to Ukraine. Let me explain the four traits that Ferrara underlines from Habermas and Derrida. Could it be that these four tra traits that make Europe, Europe, do not belong to Ukraine? Um, I, 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 re say I, re I repeat them. Political mentality different from the American one and based on same common traits. An aversion to use to the use of force for the force, first for first of all, and therefore an insistence on law and respect for international legality, support for a global system based on liberal multilateralism institution and on human rights, fruit of past in, uh, fruit of a past inspired by opposite principle and characterized by centuries of bloody carnage. I believe that Ukraine has been telling us that these values are also our values since the early 2000s and since Maidan. But we didn't look at them. We consider them these homo sovietic as you refer to, but I really like to have you here because you're Slovenian. And the Slovenian and the Galician, until more or less 100 years ago, they were part of the same empire. So the people from Lviv, Lvov, Leopold in Italian, and the people from Ljubljana were brother and sister of the Austro-Hungarian empire. Very much European, I would say. And this is also why your prime minister, the prime minister of Czech Republic and the prime minister of Poland decided to go to Kyiv because Part of Poland, part of Czechoslovakia at the time, part of Austria, Slovenia, and, and, and Ukraine were under one country, multicultural, multi people, multi racial, multi language, multi religion. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, I would say, uh, but personally, I observed what's happening in Ukraine, and I think it, it was some really interesting emergence from bottom up, people wishing democracy, what you said, uh, that uh, having European democracy, European state with strong institutions, and fighting for this. This is what uh, Dmitry Zaleski said in the last AA talk, they protested, the government changed, it was corrupt again, they protested again something which didn't happen, unfortunately, in Moscow. Uh, so there, there was a constant struggle for to become more European. They are European. And I think in, in Europe and also US, it's more, more of uh, ignorance. Uh, it's like something there. It's bit, mm, hard to say. A lot of people don't only now realize how much things are connected, how much things are important. In many, let's say, less educated pe people, which I don't mean people from the street, but people in politics uh, thought, uh -huh, Ukraine, this is something, Russia, something, East Bloc, uh, because they were just lacking uh, certain views or uh, information, which my view comes mainly from ignorance. Uh, that, that people didn't follow this. Uh, second thing, a lot of politics knows what's happening, but what should you do? There is this big bear Russia and they, they, they try not to get it angry, you know. Uh, it was similar with Slovenia. Who, why didn't anyone come and help us? Because, okay, we support you, but it's something else to send your people there to die, you know, and here is the same problem make a decision to start 
the war, you can be outside the war or the safe place, at least it looks like this, maybe it's an illusion, or get involved, it's much heavier. It's, it's you know, from the point of decision-making in politics, it's almost impossible that someone invests uh, will, would do this step, I would say, at least in Europe. Uh, so uh, I, I would say it's, it's this, it's, it's difficult to go somewhere, to send army somewhere to die, at least in this modern Europe, somehow unimaginable, uh, especially in this conflict where, where the, the enemy is, let's say, super strong. Uh, and, and the other part was ignorance of certain people who thought, okay, this is, maybe Ukraine belongs to Russia. You know, it's, one can see a lot of this simplistic thought in even in unfortunately in decision makers uh, i think now we see how much more things are connected but you see you know i i had guests very recently last week a family from viv until yesterday a family from kharkiv and their mother tongue is russian mm -hmm. They didn't speak Ukrainian. I don't even know if they are pro Zelensky or pro Putin. What I only know is that their house was destroyed by the Russians. They had to flee, they had to travel for five days, and that there were two mothers with three kids, one of which with autism that needed to be helped. Yes. This this these are tragic stories i would say and and it's so more, more than three millions refugees already yeah yes it's it's i i think europe first after i would say second world war it really feels the war again um how how it's uh somehow it's it's not there it's not just news where we start but we feel it somehow embedded. Maybe we go back to what is war, in my view. Uh, let, let me let me add something. Oh, oh go on. What is war? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, to to let's say to speak now as psychoanalyst, I think Anthony Stevens wrote a lot about it, uh, uh, and he says there are like two modes. One is the mode where we live in peace, and the other is the mode where we live internal mode where we live in in a war in a war state where he says certain archetypes are triggered um, where our mind is changed where our values are changed in society in in global let's say in normal society he writes if someone kills one person it's a murder but here if someone kills now a lot of young boys he's a hero you know the values are upside down immediately and and for instance if someone breaks in normal times bro breaks a glass on, on the window it's you call police blah blah he's a hooligan and now there are build there are cities destroyed and it's somehow uh, you know acceptable by by let's say by society in a certain view not of course not of everyone and i think this switch uh, between these archetypes is happening inside us psychologically and we feel it also now in Europe, you know, there is tension, maybe psychologically, like from the Melanie Klein's point of view, if normally we are in depressive position, which is kind of neurotic, healthy neurotic position, we are now more close to, or we, we get more often into, into the paranoid schizoid position. So kind of in other language, we, uh, you know, our ego is always moving, depends on the energy. And we would like, we would move from the neurotic position into a borderline position. At the moment, I think the whole Europe is feeling this inside. People are more stressed, more tense. It happened similar uh, in COVID, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our colleague, uh, Renos Papadopoulos, wrote about this because he, he worked with refugees all around the world and saw this phenomenon. Uh, where, where we are somehow gripped by this archetypal and then things also get po polarized. Some people are bad, some people are good. And this is also something which gives me hope. M maybe I wish for hope, you know, maybe, uh, of course, I wish for hope and a good solution. But what I don't see here is 
that much this polarity. For instance, in Balkan wars, there was real hatred between parties, you know, between the Serbs and the Croats and the and the Bosnians and the Serbs and so on. There was unfortunately real hatred and so on. And here you can see the major majority of Russians, they don't hate Ukrainians. They were somehow pushed by the system into this. Yeah. And also, also the Ukrainians are somehow pushed to fight back. It's not that they would, like in the Balkan, for instance, it was really deep archetypal hate, which came from centuries, you know, they had conflicts and one side did a bad thing and the other for centuries. So this was all somehow accumulated and came out in this war, which is also interesting because one can see, but I will jump a little in Yugoslavia, the idea of Tito was, let's be brothers, put all these nations together and we will be brothers and see socialistic paradise and all happy and it ended the disaster. And what you see that, for instance, in the Second World War, the Croats had a fascistic state which did ethnical cleansing on Serbs. And on collective level, Serbs didn't forget this. You know. Uh, they came back in this war and so on. So if you go back, there is a lot of fights and somehow on collective, it stays. When we think it's not just this conflict, we have to look in history. Uh, things do not disappear, even if Tito wanted, really worked hard to, to, this, to, to you know, establish some brotherhood, to destroy the past and all this, it didn't succeed. It somehow stayed on the unconscious level. Uh, the conflicts and the hatreds of the collective. And he, here it's a bit strange because the war might produce this hatred at the end, but at least at the beginning, there was not so much of, usually it's the game of projections. You see the evil in the other. You know, people start to see the other in war as not as human. This is another view, view also anthropological view, you know, we are like the people and then there are the whoever we are fighting, which is not really human. And here Stephen says, in his view, it comes from, you know, like the animals, uh, when they fight in between the same species, they don't hurt them that much, but they kill the other species. And he said part of this mechanism could be still in us, but instead of other species now, we have to somehow uh, make the other non-human in yeah. order to kill him. Uh, and this happens through the projections and so on, where we project our shadow. Uh, and I hope this will not go to the whole extent in this conflict, because one can see in at least normal army on the Russian side, they're not that motivated and so on. It was the same in Slovenia. The normal soldier said, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I sitting in this tank and waiting to get blown up? And uh, our army said, if you give up, um, you will not go to prison. We give you civilian clothes and put you to the train home. And then they massively gave up, you know, because this young boy started to think I can be in eight hours eating my mother's soup. Uh, what the hell am I doing here? You know, it were only officers who were pushing. And I think in part, at least these normal soldiers are similarly uncomfortable there. Of course, there is this professional army, which is which are killers with probably some psychopathic traits and so on. But I hope this, let's say, hatred will not escalate. Which this is was kind of uh, sort of an engine of the war, I would say. This was another question that you already answered. Will it be total war in Europe? We truly hope not, but the tension is there. Let's go back to the concept of uh, the, the, the mother complex. So you somehow underline it as positive, the mother that takes care. And I would like actually to the negative father complex. And start actually from your former Kaiser, Franz Josef. <laughs> Why is for me is very important to link history. It's well known that historians look at World War II as a continuation 
reparation, compensation in Jungian terms of World War I. Yeah. Hitler was able to talk to the Germans and to tell them, through me, we will make Germany great again, which are words that we know very well from Trump. It we, is very well known from historian that was Prussia more than Austria that wanted to go to war against the Russians, especially because the Austrian were not fighting since the middle 19th century, you know, when they retrieved for, from the Italian lands. So one can say, you know, it, after World War I, acted as a country to repair the humiliation and devastation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is what is happening right now comparable if we switch, switch, switch Hitler with Putin? So Russia, the, the father or the, or the father, father complex, complex, the concept of compensation. I believe that if we look at Jung, if we look at Frick, if you if love you your father, you think uh, there is a problem with the audio. Yes, it's, it's somehow the line gets broken. Right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I can. Okay. So look at Freud and Jung experience with their father. They thought their father was a hero. And we know the very famous story of Freud with his father meeting, meeting an anti-Semite to say, go away, Jew, and, and throw his hat away. And the father didn't do much. Or, or Jung that thought the father was a hero, but then he realized that actually was a loser. He lost his faith, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I wonder whether psychologically, they need to compensate that, that hero-less becoming heroes. Jung and Freud became their own heroes with their own myth, yeah? Even starting something huge, psychoanalysis. Could this apply to Putin, who was ashamed not only by his father Yeltsin, a drunken, Gorbachev that threw perestroika, fucked up the Soviet Union. But he, in his speech 22 days ago, blamed Lenin for Ukrainians autonomy, which yeah. is actually a wrong, a, a fake news or a wrong historical fact because it is Yeltsin who in 1991 signed an agreement for the autonomy of Ukraine, Latvia and, um, and something else. And Belarus, I guess. Sorry if the historical fact is not correct. Could it be that there is a negative father complex working right now? It's, it's an interesting thought. You said really nice, you know, Hitler said, make Germany great again, you know? And I think this, it's, it's the same goes for Putin. His idea is make Russia great again. Yeah. This is what's, it's, it's, and it's the frustration. Now, in my view, one has to look at the group. Uh, this is what I wrote extensively about. And it's, it's if, you, if one looks at Bion, you know, Wilfried Bion, his idea was that the group acts as a subject. And actually the same thought one can find uh, with, with Jung writing about it. Uh, uh, so both, both came to the idea that the group works as a subject. What's, um, you know, Beyond said kind of a infantile subject and what Jung said, Jung noticed this, more people, he said, more people are at the table at the party, more stupid are the conversation. Somewhere else he wrote, bring 100 most clever people together and you will get a crowd of idiots, you know, because we meet in the those uh, common uh, common things, common denominators. How to say it? More people are together, less things are common. More basic things are common. More, more simple things are common. You cannot have a, a really deep conversation 
in a huge crowd where everyone would follow, agree, understand, because we have less and less things common. So the crowd gets stupider. And Jung said, like the, the huge states are like lizards somehow. Uh, and, and this is why he said he likes small states because they have something humane or small nations, humane in, in them. Uh, and, and I think one, one way to view is as a subject, you know, like humiliated, humiliated Germany and now Russia, you know, it's, which one could connect to this, you know, what you said, the, the negative father complex, of course, on the other side, it's, it's the, the, this subject, Russians, let's say, as a subject, they, there is this, you know, fantasy to be the great state, uh, which has some truth in it, but they lost this position after the collapse of Soviet Union. Mm. And, and uh, so, so one has to think, when one looks at the leader, I think this is important, as uh, that the leader is sort of, uh, and this is again beyond thought, and also Jung's thought, uh, a reflection of the nation. You know, if the nation is mature, uh, you cannot, Putin wouldn't succeed in Sweden. He would be thrown out of political party. Yeah, then... yeah, the comments are clear in uh, Jung's paper titled After the Catastrophe. Where yes. actually very good read to understand current populist movements. And of course, Putin is one. Let's talk about psychopathology. Is it useful to psychopathologize Putin? Is it inappropriate? What is your take? Every time there is journalists want to psychopathologize him or her, look at Trump, look at Boris Johnson, look at many other. Uh, as I said, the, the problem is that Hitler, Putin, Boris Johnson, Trump, they are a reflection of a uh, collective psyche. So it's not that Putin kidnapped Russia. You know, he's a reflection of collective psyche. The psyche there enabled him or chosen him even uh, to get into this position. As I said, this couldn't happen in Sweden, for instance. Uh, in, uh, but I think Russia, I don't have the answer, let's put it this way, but in my view, they are collectively traumatized. Yeah. You know, if you look into the past, it's just one tragedy after the other. From the war, from the wars, revolutions to the so Soviet empire, people were constantly traumatized. Also, if one looks at Putin's life, he was born in St. Petersburg, where his parents, you know, were survivors of the siege, uh, where one million people, or I think one million and a half died, maybe I'm wrong here, people were eating, you know, cannibalism and so on. So, so, and uh, he's, he was born after this. I think, as, if I understand correctly, his parents lost the children at that time. So he was the only survivor, let's put, and, uh, What's there in the collective when you survive this, when his parents survived this? How, what, how was this society? Even in the 50s, it was totally cruel where he grew up and the, there was just the, the power what was counting, you know? There was no humane, let's put it this way, due to situation. And, and th this is how trauma works on collective level, you know? It's, it's, it's a society like you're in prison or something like that. They said they lived in, uh, at that time, uh, it was like collective living. People didn't have, at that time, their own flat and they worked all day, the children were alone. Uh, you know, some terrible conditions, a lot of violence and so on. And out of this, Putin is born, you know? Uh, which means the society is like that. It's the power that counts. Uh, and, and in communism, there were still some ideas, you know? And now it looks, this, let's say, they are gone. Now it looks, yeah. it's, it's really just the power, you know. Yeah. Uh, there, there are no, <laughs> communism in its core, it had some humanistic ideas, although... Yeah, it was clear. I mean, Stephen's very clear about it. As War, 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 war one, one was about, about 
wishing for a better life. We went to war to fight the enemy for a better world. World War II was about an idea, Nazism, communism. Now, who knows? Yes. My feeling is that the very this war is about reset. But reset of what? Let me tell you. <clears throat> in 2000, in 2000 it's, it's really problematic, really problematic now. Now. Yes. Let me try. Let me try. In 2008, um, when Obama became president, he proposed for a symbolic reset, reset to Putin. There is a gag between Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State, and Lavrov, current exterior minister, where Hillary Clinton gives him a present that is a reset button. So we would like to start a new reset our relationship. It didn't work. Could be this war be a, as a reset? And if so, of what? Uh, this is what makes me worried because you said one should return after the catastrophe. And, and uh, you know, for Germany and for Europe, uh, the catastrophe was sort of reset. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which enabled actually this. There is an Italian saying say there should be a war. You would know if there is a war, which is exactly this, you know, war is total reset. Sorry. On one thing, it's it's in, uh, interesting. Like in last four thousand years of history that we know, let's say quite well, in some statistic there is one war, one year of peace to thirteen years of war. So we are kind of mind monkeys who are all the time in the war. Uh, and also, in, so in last half of nineteenth century and twentieth century, all the big na nations were somehow connected in some war every 20 years so with each generation so it, it looks like the war is something implicit in in our genes you know if someone would watch humans out of space it would say this is some violent war war species um uh, so this is kind of nature this is the question this is interesting thought when you said is war masculine? Men are fighting mainly, but on the other, on the symbolic level, it looks like war is part of the nature and violence. So, if one looks at Neumann's theories, it would be like, uh, you know, war belongs to to the nature, to the mother archetype, and then if the consciousness moves into the realm of father of logos there is a chance of peace so on the level of logos on some agreements uh you know symbolically i i think this is hard to accept for for some people there you know that it's uh, people would it's contraintuitive people would say aha it's the father is the man which is the war and then it's the female men fight this is true but on symbolic level you know it's it's the logos is the father who should make order because in the nature stronger so strongest survive you know like now in russia putin is the strongest and he holds the yeah. you know pattern He's, there is no space for some humanistic president and so on uh, at the moment but only if he will be changed he'll be another strong man you know um, so there needs to be change of values one view is that the East didn't have the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, which came out of Italy, which the West had, at least Europe. Uh, the, this is one view, and you know, will this catastrophe bring bring this change? And it's interestingly that Ukraine wants this change. This change was happening, you know, some 
enlightenment turn to we, we want democracy we want plurality we want all the colors of life because this is how i see the socialistic times they were gray you know? there was not this plurality and what's happening now in russia it looks like it would be pushed back you know with, with all people are not allowed to say what they think again although it looked so good for some time and and What's interesting that Ukraine is actually on this way, and it looks like this is totally bothering certain structures which Putin represents in Russia. I think this is the big, the real problem is they are becoming Europe. You know, and, yeah. and what's bothering them is because people will say, oh, but if they succeed, people will say, we also want strong institutions. Where people at the power at the moment maybe can say goodbye, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he is a kind of patriarchal or narrow-minded father yeah, who doesn't that's allow that's kids that's to individually to separate, to live their life and be open to transformation. Let me read something from Ilman about war, because it's important. It's from a terrible love from for war. There is no practical solution to war because war is not a problem solvable by the practical mind, which is better equipped for its conduct than for its avoidance or conclusion. War belongs to our soul as an archetypal truth of the cosmos. It is a human work and an inhuman horror and a law that no other love has been able to overcome. We can open our eyes to this terrible truth and, becoming aware of it, devote all our passionate intensity to undermining the enactment of war strengthened by the courage the culture possesses, even in the dark ages, to continue to sing as it resists war. We can understand it better, postpone it longer, work to gradually remove it from the support of a hypocritical religion. But the war as such will remain until the gods themselves leave. Yes. It's, it's, Intense. It's... it's, it's... A sad thought, but may, maybe, you know, what Stephen says, the gods live, gods are the archetypes, the implicit the biology. So the question is, can, can we get into this level of logos, you know, to, 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 find, to find peace? But I think, as you said, it looks like there also needs to be an evolution, which is happening in Ukraine. And which is needed in Russia, evolution of consciousness uh, to, you know, plurality in certain sense, which means not necessarily, this is Zizek says this nicely, we don't need to love the other, you know. But, you know, if you come to the level where you can coexist with the other, you know, yeah. you don't need to love now, I don't know, whatever. Uh, so, but can we have so much respect to coexist? Different religions, different nations. This is this question. Uh, and uh, this happened, I would say, in Europe after the catastrophe. This coexistence uh, and peace, you know, now war between Germany and France is unimaginable. Um, yeah, these are the values that Abamas and Derrida were talking about. Yes. Um, Let me add something. This is from Mauro Magatti, my sociological mentor, who wrote on the 1st of March on Avenire, a Catholic newspaper in Italy. By bringing war back to the heart of Europe, Putin has definitively broken the global liberal order that arose after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Then he pointed out that Putin intends to test the West resistance. And I would add, so distant now are the words of German sociologist Ulrich Beck, who pointed out that 
the declaration of independence must be transformed into the declaration of interdependence. Cooperate or die, said Ulrich Beck. And these, I propose, must be on a global scale. Because, as Beck says, the traumatic vulnerability of all and the consequence responsibility for all, including one's all survival. Beck adds that nationalism is particularly toxic, so he proposed a cosmopolitan perspective. I totally buy this. I totally agree this. Actually, you and I and Monica Lucci are building a conference in Ljubljana in 2023, also about this theme. But I wonder whether I am a bit naive to hope what Beck hopes. Let me add something. It will be a bit long, but I kind of feel I have to do a mea culpa or even to call myself naive. In the series of interviews I conducted at the early stage of the COVID pandemic, um, which would become a book and you will be part of it, I commented on the COVID and I hope that the pandemic, which has exposed us to profound uncertainty, could be a proof to be an opportunity for change and new beginnings, an opportunity to decelerate, to reflect and realize that nature intended for us to move from the external world to the internal world, from extroversion into introversion, then to inferiority and the soul, to be able later to return to the outside and maintain an inner outer balance. I hoped, we hoped that the post-COVID challenge to be to move from a world based on hopes and expectation of the linear world to one where interiority and spirituality, if not even uh, a spirituality, if not necessarily religious, are once again contemplated so that something can truly begin to sprout, namely the creativity of the soul. So that in this sense, authentic creativity, creative imagination is what is lacking in a postmodern or second late modern society. Because we Jungians believe that creativity and creative imagination hide fluidity and pluralism. And if flu fluidity rather than individualization and liquidity is fostered, there will be a chance to counteract anxiety, depression, suicidality, and thus anomie. Anomie occurs when emotions are blocked, whereas when one is able to translate emotion into images, is able to find what is in the hidden emotion, and one is inwardly calm and reassured. Listening to myself and even writing this stuff, I was aware of the risk of being perceived as naive. And Now I know, I was naive and Michel Hulbeck was right when he said, the world will be the same after the pandemic, only a little bit worse. What do you think? So, some, some heavy <laughs> words at the end. <sighs> Personally, I have to say this idea that there would be no nations and so on, it's nice, you know, but on the other side, is certain identity really wrong? Or should we speak about plurality, you know? Yeah. Uh, why don't, I think, okay, Italian, we should respect Italians for the culture and so on. Why don't we, why we shouldn't strive to plurality? Similar, similarly as in the psyche of a person, you find many things. And if you accept them, you know, certain plural view on the psyche, you're not neurotic. Neurosis comes when someone doesn't accept certain parts of, of, of a person. Um, and uh, on collective level, one could say neurosis is when in society or in certain states have certain tensions, but this is still not war. I think war 
War happens when the structures collapse, and this is actually on individual level psychosis, but structure collapse, the content is flooded. But but uh, let's say there should be some content. There should, in my view, should be some nationality. It makes the world, let's say, interesting. But the question is, can we live with respect, with you know, certain plural view, everyone should have its space and so on. You know, in, in, in this sense, what Europe could manage after the World War II. And, and uh, I think this is actually at stake here. Uh, what, what this war is about, what Ukraine wanted, you know, because Ukraine uh, was not nationalistic state, you know, they, they, it, it's actually multi-ethical and their idea was this democratic society where they all live in certain plurality. And I think the, this, this, this is why this war is actually war, war for this plurality, for this um, state of consciousness actually. And on the other side, it's a state of consciousness uh, where it's not about respect, but it's about power. Let me ask you something more about power. Because it's very easy to blame Putin right now. We Europeans are very clear about this, although there are many idiots that claim, oh, we have to look at the historical context. No, Putin... Putin's army invaded Ukraine. Maybe there are many Russians, even colleagues that oppose it, but it's a fact. Russia invaded Ukraine. This is the difficult question. What is the difference between this war, Putin attacking Ukraine, and the crap perpetrated by the United States since World War II, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. What about the US invasion and occupation or political destabilization since 1946 under the guise of liberating them and since 1991 under the pretext of spreading liberal democracy? Maurizio Ferrara, which I quoted before, wrote on Colorriere della Sera on the 7th of March that the invasion of Iraq so, sorry, he looked at the U.S. invasion of Iraq and underlines that some commentators observe that that invasion by the U.S. was a predetermined carnage, just like the one of the last 20 days in Ukraine, which took place after months of preparation. Ferrara reminded us that Nobel Prize for Literature of Svetlana Alexievich has drawn a very clear picture of the imperiality impulses, not only of Putin, but also of a large part of the Russian population. As you mentioned before, she called it the Omus Sovieticus. What about the imperialistic impulses of the US? And apart from the US, Every time the British invaded and occupied a country, they created problems and civil wars. Once they left, for example, Kenya, Cyprus, Palestine, they will occupy, and they still occupy part of Ireland. By the way, Palestine is under occupation since 74 years, Ukraine, 20 years. So let's not forget all the other countries. Are the action of the British crown and the death they caused any different than those of Stalin, of Putin, of the US, of Hitler, of Mussolini, of Franco? We could go on. When colonial Britain occupied countries and took everything from them, or the capitalist US invited countries for geopolitical reasons and for their goods. Ferrara, looking at your compatriot, Slavoj Žižek, who said that recently 
Putin feels himself the patriarch of an organic community in which be, being free means staying in one's own place. And, and Zizek added that uh, Dugin, Alexander Dugin, so Putin's court philosopher, convinced Putin that truth consists in what one believes. Truth consists in what one believes. So if the United States don't believe Russian truth, the world must be made to decide. But what about, what to say to the Ukrainian people? Zizek wonders. It is not entitled to its own truth? Are they not entitled to their own truth? Or is Ukraine merely a battlefield for the use of those who want to rule the world? Power, as you said before. So the division into spheres of influence is still a fact of the contemporary international system with which we must reckon. Europe should follow its vocation and act through diplomacy and mediation However, when war is established, an established fact on our borders, it's very difficult. What is the difference between this invasion, what the US, the British, and many other countries did in the past few decades, centuries to perpetrate their imperialistic impulses? This is, this is a good question. At least in my views, there are certain similarities, but also certain differences. Uh, of course, when one talks about Britain, one talks about, uh, let's say, past. And, and, and if we talk about 19th century, 18th century, uh, it was a different, more violent culture, also more racistic culture. Uh, one, one has to put these things into a certain perspective. What is one thing is all these huge nations, you know, they, 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 there is certain imperialistic impulse. And it's also what one sees now psychologically what's happening in Ukraine. Russians don't really understand why don't they want us? You know, Putin was expecting everyone will give up and celebrate after three days. Um, some people will be against, but most of people will be happy. And it's similar with American invasions. You know, they also thought we will go to Iraq and everyone will be happy, democracy and so on. And, the, you know, uh, they didn't expect that people will not like them, not want them. It's, it's the same here. And I think it's a certain egocentric, maybe narcissistic view of these big nations. Well, we are the cool one. We are those who, have, who are right, you know, uh, and others should be happy to join us. This is one view. The second view where I think a lot of theorists, political theorists are wrong, is this perception that NATO is moving towards Russia. And I think it's just not true. What I said about Slovenia, they didn't want us in. They didn't want to help us. They actually say, stay, stay in Yugoslavia, you know. And also here with Ukraine, NATO is now forced somehow to act to help and the West. But to be frank, if you would ask most of the West leaders, they would say they would be happy if there would be no conflict. For instance, if Ukrainian would say, oh, we all like to join Russia, they would say, okay, no war, you know. It's, it's, I think it's kind of a long stretch to say NATO wanted to move in. They wanted NATO because it would represent certain safety. But the NATO didn't want them in because it knows it, knows it means trouble, you know. So this idea of NATO is pushing towards its, uh, I think this, you know, US can use, or the capital can use other ways to have influences. You know, there is McDonald's in Moscow, now they closed it, but, you know, to get in, you don't need NATO to open McDonald's. Uh, if we talk about capital. Uh, and there is this certain, what I talked before is, is if Ukrainians are now individuating as we are, we are still in process, you know. If I look at Slovenia, this transition is not concluded. The institutions still don't work as they should. Uh, but this, this is the wish. Uh, and, and I think this is one perspective which one could see as certain 
individuation of the nation. So can we get our own language? Some, some psychologists uh, on the list also, they got it wrong, individuations, individuation should be connected with the mother complex and so on. And then they said, Russia, it's not the mother, actually it's Ukraine, it's the mother and so on, which is all true. But individuation actually means that the whole potential or let's say as much as possible of a person or a country comes to life. And for this, you need plurality, either in psyche that I can develop my different parts or in country, you need freedom, you need plurality that people can be artists, can, be, can write books, can write what they want, can make movies like they want, can open companies, can open restaurants and so on. Not that there is certain structure, certain complex, could be mother complex, which is prohibiting this and that and that and only certain view. And I think this is the struggle here, which, which Americans, I think, naively think we are bringing in the freedom. I think they really believe uh, there was a fantastic, maybe also sad documentary. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, it's the unknown unknowns uh, about uh, Rumsfeld. And you really see he has some... It's, you can see psychologically, it's a typical psychopath. Uh, and, and, but what's interesting is he has certain pseudo philosophy. It's not a real philosophy, but he really believes it. Uh, yeah, I mean, Rumsfeld with Cheney were <clears throat> there already when uh, uh, George Bush's father became president and uh, addressing the nation on the uh, 11th of September, 89, which is not an easy day, he said, uh, uh, I bring you a new order, yes. which meant for him global peace, peace and the spread of liberal democracy. What followed was Iraq and everything else we know. Yes. Yeah, so without having to... I truly hope, Tine maybe even calling me naive, because the truth is that I believe that the world goes on like the four season, the way it has to go. Maybe it's God, maybe it's nature, maybe it's the cosmos, but I truly hope that this work can be a reset in co-construction of meaning, where really the country become interdependent in the co-construction of meaning. And yes, although war is terrible, hopefully it's going to be an opportunity for change and new beginnings. And yes, for interiority, before to go once again outside to the world. These are where the ideas of the COVID, for me, are still the ideas here. Co-construction of meaning, new beginnings, a new phase. I, I have to say, I was thinking about this today. And then uh, this co-construction of meaning, you know, we know it in therapy, something terrible happens to someone and then we somehow co-construct a meaning, which is really therapeutic. But, you know, if you would ask this person, <laughs> would you like, if you would go back that this happened again, everyone, we usually say no, you know. So we somehow give meaning to bad things that we can somehow uh, symbolize them and live with them and so on. Uh, and maybe they do really have a meaning. It's, it's a tough question, I think. Yeah. I think what's here happening is that this space, it's not just Russia, but also Belarus and all countries, they need a certain uh, revolution of consciousness towards this plurality and so on. And, uh, that this is happening now, what, what happened in Europe, let's say, uh, in, in the wars, first and the second war. And this is why I'm also afraid that maybe the a catastrophe is needed for change. You know? Unfortunately, yeah. But that's why I call myself naive, because the catastrophe that we went through COVID, it seems it didn't help. Hard to say. I, I think about COVID, we will see 
one shouldn't expect too much, but I think certain things will change. My personal view is we became digitalized. It's something third, you know, what yeah. emerged. And I think this digital digitalization that I don't need now to apply to Berlin to talk with you or you to Ljubljana, it's very important for uh, from the view of ecology, actually. Uh, I hope there will be less travel. I, I love to travel, but uh, because of ecology. That this yeah. might be certain change. People can work from home. Uh, yeah. You don't need to keep two buildings work at home. You don't need to drive to work every day and so on. Uh, maybe this is one view. Uh, more practical, not, not so socially, let's say. But but here, uh, here I wanted to add one thing about Russia. But still, if one looks at Germany, they were really gripped by this Wotan archetype, you know. Uh, they, they were blind, you know, the Jews were really not human. The, 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 I'm sorry, the, they were blinded and also uh, what I wanted to say, there was very little opposition. Now, if you look at the Russians, they are not so blinded. So there is what I talked before, not this hate towards Ukrainian as there was in Germany towards the Jewish people. They, they see them as brother and more like we should, you know, the, the Nazis had the idea at the end we need to wipe out all other races and we have to rule the world or populate the And this idea is not here, you know, the idea is we should be together with our brothers and, but they somehow don't want it and we don't really understand why. Uh, it's, it's a similar idea maybe. You have to be under me, or like I am the man in the house, I run, so you have to be under me, otherwise I kill you, otherwise I exterminate you. My feeling of what is happening in Mariupol now is exactly this. You don't want to stay under my roof, I kill you all. Yes, and it's half of the population there is Russian speaking, you know? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is the difference, let's say, between the Germans one could see it also here in times of Yugoslavia, like the Serbs, you know, they said, we are brothers, let's live together. Why do we want to live, you know? And, and here it's the same idea. Why do we want to live? I don't want to live together with us and so on. A certain sentiment. So it's, it's not quite, and I think it might be similar naivety with Americans going to Iraq, you know, and free them and, you know, and they, at the end, they don't cooperate. They don't understand why. And here it's the same. The Russians don't really understand Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, this is one part, just another part in Russia. The, there is 30% of people who are against war, which is quite a lot. It's one third. And they're protesting and so on. And one couldn't see this in, in Nazi Germany. You know, it was much more obsessed because I think this is also obsession of certain archetypes. Uh, but the Germans were much more obsessed. There was less reflection, less, less protests, and more hatred. So let's hope these are some better signs that this won't develop into this cat catastrophe which happened in, 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 in uh, Germany and in Europe uh, in, in the 40s. Let's hope not. Thank you very much, Tine. Good night. Thank you, Stefano, for this opportunity. <laughs> Always a pleasure.